Now I am. Nice. Wow, man. Your mustache mustache game is strong. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) It took uh, Uh, Kinsey a while to appreciate it. Uh, It's been close to a year now, and she's finally it's finally growing on her. No pun intended. It's it's growing on your face. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it took me no time at all to appreciate it. Yeah, (laughs) it's always guys that come up to me and are like, "Dude, nice stash." I am a mustache lover. Yeah. Is that, is this, does that sound weird? That sounds weird. Yeah. A bit. <laughs> um, so you're in LA, right? Yep. In the North Hollywood area. Okay. Because Ken C is an actor. Yep. That's cool, man. How is that going for her? It's going well. She... Uh... Auditions have started picking up now that things are starting to get a little bit more normal. Um, right. And the, the industry kind of really changed. And now everything is video recording. So you just sit at home and um, record your auditions and send them in. There's not that many in-person things anymore. Now, we just saw each other recently in Moab, which was super cool. You mm-hmm. and I met for the first time and Kinsey and I met face to face for the first time. Shut up, you little shit. <laughs> one one side I'll get him real quick. Yeah man, take your time. Uh, to everybody out there, check out my mug. Isn't that hilarious? Here's the um, culprit. Forever there's the culprit. <laughs> oh he or she is a super cutie. Yeah his name is Murray. Murray, good name. I was just showing everybody out there my mug. Can you, re- can you read that? Yeah. <laughs> um, to everybody out there listening and not watching, my mug says, a good day is when you don't pee yourself, which is true. Which is true. <laughs> One thing, I'm going to shut that door real quick. He's watching dogs. Ah, little... uh, I yell at dogs, too. <laughs> okay so for um everyone out there you work for van do it mm-hmm. right and what is your official title uh marketing yes yeah, so marketing I, team yeah i think my official title on the website is like marketing specialist or something like that but Really, when I started out at Van Duet, we were pretty small at the time. We had a factory that could only work on like two or three vans at a time. And so I kind of was the guy doing a bunch of random things. So I was doing sales, um, marketing, the customer relationship management system, like helping manage that. Um, so I still kind of do a lot of random stuff for Van Duet. Um, but marketing is the main focus. So we put out like a newsletter every day and I do that. Um, we're about to start ramping up our blog. Um, so I'm really working on capturing content for that. Um, and then that's what we're doing today. Yep. So you, um, are writing a blog on my van. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, we're, we're talking about it and you're um, getting all the info for the story for writing that blog. Mm -hmm. Very cool. You put out a newsletter every day. Yeah. It's so right now it's not necessarily Van do it specific. It is uh, specific to the outdoor world. So it's kind of, I go around the internet and find like best or like most underrated national parks that you may not that you may not ever think of. So it's not like arches and Grand Canyon and stuff like that that everybody goes to. It's the ones that are kind of like hidden gyms or yeah, how to find yep. free camping in your area. Um, Twenty of the best Dutch oven roast over the fire recipes, things like that. Um, just like tips and outdoor industry news and stuff like that. So. 
I'm, I'm impressed. Um, I get the emails every day with the, the adventure newsletter it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, you're hustling, man. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad people like it. Um, cause at first it just felt like I was throwing a bunch of stuff in there and sending it out to everybody, but it looking at the amount of people that open it every day, it seems like people enjoy getting that. So it's good to know that that work is being appreciated. So that's cool. Um, I need to open it more apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be better at that. <laughs> um, okay. So for everyone out there, I want to tell them how I met you guys before we get into it. Mm -hmm. um, now I got a message. Uh, well, I was doing extensive van research. Let's say that very extensive. So it was out there in the ether that I was interested in vans. And I received a message from you guys. I, I, I re it's been so long now uh, that I can't remember exactly who it was. I think it was Alan's wife. Um, okay. Is that right? I don't know. What's her name? Her name is Daniela. I almost wonder nah. if it was Kaylee Klein. I think it was Kaylee. It was Kaylee. I got a message from Kaylee on LinkedIn of all places. Okay. Um, and. Alan, I've, Alan says, and I've been told that it was not a bot email, but <laughs> pretty sure it was <laughs> uh, because it was out there in the ether that I was, it was searching vans. Mm -hmm. um, but I did click on the link and look at your guys' stuff. I was like, oh, this could actually work because that's the first thing I always look at with a van. Can this work for what I need? Can I get my bike inside? Can I get around in my wheelchair inside the van? Mm -hmm. um, is it the configuration I want? And I was like, holy crap, this could actually work. So I messaged back and it was Kenzie, who is your partner, wife. wife. Yep. You guys are married. Kenzie emailed me back and we became fast friends. We had, you know, some long phone conversations about life, not even about vans. And uh, she was my first connection really with Van Do It. And um, it was cool to finally meet her face to face and get to meet you for the mm -hmm. first time in Moab. Uh, God, was that just a month ago, a month or two ago now? Yeah, was it the few weeks? Like the beginning of October, kind of. And uh, we're mid November now, so yeah, maybe five or six weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, that was such Pretty a cool, cool event. That was cool. Um, I'm finally getting to the video on that. Mm -hmm. what six weeks later if i'm that far behind on my videos i'm finishing my one on sedona which was i was at the day before i came to moab and saw you guys and uh once i'm done with this one then i'm gonna start cutting the moab one mm -hmm. i want to get um austin's footage he said yeah. he got some drone sh drone shots it was before i got there but some drone shots of um, all the vans um corralled up so i want to yeah. get those shots i want to get those shots from him yeah, I also have a blog that's been in the chamber about that event um, that I'm about ready to hit publish on. So, ooh, just, maybe just, um, uh, you you can include my video in there if I finish it in time. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, but it's I'm convinced it's one of the most unique things in the van life community, the the van do it community, just because sure you see like other van life meetups and stuff like that but the fact that the van do it community is themselves organizing these events and getting together and 20 vans or something like that show up to these places just where the only thing they really have in common is they are all van do it owners is is so cool to me and it's it's something i haven't seen elsewhere um it, it probably exists but i ha haven't seen it yet Specific that was my program. that was my first experience. That was my first Van Do It get together, and now I'm like super close friends with everybody now. Yeah, it's freaking awesome. Have you heard about um, the Bentonville event coming up? Yeah, I think holy they're... crap, it's gonna be it's gonna be massive. Yeah, I think it's gonna be crazy because I think Van Do It is also gonna get a little bit more involved with this one to help. Uh, organize some stuff, maybe some event sponsor, maybe some events or, or things like that. And 
I know they're trying to contact Benton Bill to help for them to help find it, the best area for everybody to meet. I could see. I've actually that. made the connection with the Visitors Bureau mm-hmm. and Van Do It. Um, they had a, another meeting yesterday. Um, but yeah, we found a huge grass field. Mm-hmm. Um, it's off the Applegate Trail here. I'm pointing this way because it's right out my door here. Um, and uh, it links up to Kohler Mountain Bike Preserve. It can fit probably 100 vans in this field. So mm-hmm. it looks like we're going to do it there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be exciting. I could, and but, Van Do It is putting a ton of money into it. And so is the Vitter, Visitors Bureau here. So it's mm-hmm. going to be very well funded. Yeah. Yeah, I could see like 50 vans, 50 Van Do It's hanging out in Bentonville that weekend. They're saying 70. Really? Is what they're predicting for this one. Yeah. That'd be insane. <laughs> right? It started at 30. Yeah. And you know, Kurt. It went from 30 to 40 to 50, like nonchalantly, just in conversation mentioning. I'm like, wait, 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 hold on a second. The difference between 30 and 50 vans, this is this is a big deal. Like we yeah. need to clarify these numbers. It's pretty funny. And now it's gone up. And then it jumped to 70. And now, now we're talking 100 vans they're thinking are going to be there. Yeah. It's going to be insane. You're looking at like close to like 175 people or something like that if you get 100 vans there. Yeah, man, there's going to be food trucks. Uh, Van Duet's going to cater a big dinner one night. There's going to be a live band one night, probably that same night. Mm-hmm. Um, really nice, like truck trailer porta johns with showers. Yeah. And right off trails. Oh, and the, the, um, the town is also organizing um, some group rides, but also some group hikes because not everybody rides. Um, a restaurant tour. Um, a, a bar tour, an mm-hmm. art tour. <laughs> the town is organizing all this stuff for us. It's going to be cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, it's insane to see what Van Do It has turned into over three years, going from like a van a month or a couple of vans a month, and now there's potentially a hundred vans that could show up at an event three years later, right? And Van Do It's pumping out like almost 20 vans a month yeah right now right mm-hmm. this is awesome the facility is beautiful i'm going to be going back up in a few weeks to get some uh, some stuff done on the van nice. so i'm pretty excited i'm pretty excited to get to hang out with everybody yeah other than the um the way you found van do it what was kind of your experience like through the, the process of getting your van uh, the, the process was really cool. I worked with Alan. He was my mm-hmm. van guru <laughs> for everybody, out, for all the listeners and watchers out there. The way it works is you, you fill out a form online, a kind of what you want configuration you want, because you can plug and play the modular aspects of the van. And then you're connected with what van do it calls a van guru. And so I was connected with Alan and he and I became friends like we would just talk about what I wanted in the van when I was, you know, on my drives, you yeah. know, driving from San Diego to Mammoth or or whatever. And we became friends. And then it came down to the point, okay, you got to pay your, your draw, your, your 10%. You got to put 10%, 10% down on your van in order to get in the queue for your bill. Mm-hmm. And when it came to that point, I was like, okay, it's real now. Um, and I have to, it's, and so I needed to play the field. (laughs) (laughs) I went out and did, I was already doing extensive van research, but now I got nitty gritty. Uh, I'm friends with a a local uh, Ford dealer in Encinitas. And so I had a van there. They had the exact van I wanted. Um, I was going to one of my choices was to buy that van and then, you know, build it out myself, go kind of the minimalistic route at first, you know, and build it out over time or van do it. Or I was on RV trader every day, just going through all the vans and researching, looking at RVs, looking at um, trailers extensively. I I'm, was really, really close to buying a trailer because that's mm-hmm. much less expensive than a van, a tra- you know, a trailer. Yeah. Um, I was looking at trading in the Subaru to get something that had a little more towing capacity. 
And I, dude, I was close, man. I was close to doing the trailer thing. I was close to buying that, that gutted van. Um, but then, uh, my buddy who's a van builder, he, he's very niche. He does very high end, completely custom jobs. Mm -hmm. The vans that he builds are just immaculately beautiful. Um, he is in Cardiff in North County, San Diego, um, where I'm from and live mm. part time. He, uh, I, 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 okay. It came down to it where I needed to make a decision if I was going to, you know, put money down on my van, do a van or, or go a different route. And I, I texted him. I was like, Hey man, here's the, here's the deal. Here's how it works. A van do it, how much it's going to cost and everything. And he said, do it. That is a really, really good deal what you're getting for that price mm -hmm. and what they're doing for you. Um, Cause I'm part of your ambassador program mm -hmm. and the custom stuff that you guys are willing to do for me that I need personally, you know, wheelchair life stuff. He was like, do it, do it, man. Um, and once I made the decision, uh, well, actually right before I made the decision, what pushed me off the fence was, um, you guys bumped me up in the queue. Alan said, we want to get this done for you and get it done a little faster. And that's what did it. Pushed me over the edge. Boom. Sent mm -hmm. the money that day. And I was in the family instantly. Yeah. That's kind of how, <laughs> that's kind of how it went down. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah, pretty cool, awesome. man. It was pretty cool. And it's, it went by fast. I, I, I it seemed like I had no time. And then I was in Kansas city finishing the build. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything kind of just living the wheelchair lifestyle? I know there's probably some modifications and stuff they had to do specifically mm -hmm. for your van that they wouldn't yep. necessarily well, have done for other people. Well, in any van, what I have to, the two things I need are a lift to get in and mm -hmm. hand controls so I could drive with my hands. Um, and any other van, I got to pay cash for that. Um, but Van Do It paid for it for me and put it into my financing. Mm -hmm. That's huge. It's an extra uh, 15 grand yeah. on top of the price of the van for me, for any van I get. But the fact that I didn't have to shell out all that cash and I could yeah. use that cash for my down payment instead. And Van Do It was willing to do that for me was really, really cool. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. the main modification just to make the van functional so i can get in and out and drive it mm -hmm. now as far as the you know living space um there's a few different things that we had to do custom uh the main thing is a bathroom um i have to have a bathroom on the road for just what i need to do to take care of myself it's really really important i could get by you know i was camping out of my subaru and i was getting mm -hmm. by but it's pretty uncomfortable i yeah. some some nights i have to spend a lot of time in the bathroom and I was doing that outside in the cold. Um, yeah. that gets, old, that gets old really fast. That is not a fun experience. Um, so I wanted to be inside comfortable, warm, and be able to do everything two in one shower bathroom all together. And so they made a custom little bathroom pod for me. They don't mm -hmm. do that. So that was cool. And also the, the little like bathroom pod, serves as a transfer surface kind of a a butt step i call yeah. it <laughs> so i use that to transfer up to and then i can transfer up to the bed from there oh nice so that was pretty much the main main thing mm -hmm. um and then they put in uh no oh, the other big thing they did is they made the bed powered so it has a the vans have a hydraulic bed in the back the live model which i have mm -hmm. And you have to use a ratchet crank to crank it up or down. Um, and they made mine powered for me. Yeah. Um, which is epic. It's just much easier for me physically, but also it's how we pull my bike into yeah. the van. So I've got little, they made little ramps for my bike. And I put the bike on the ramps and I connect it with a strap to the bed. And then I raise the bed. I have a switch on the inside and the outside. Oh, nice. So it, 
Yeah. And so I, I'm outside. I load the bike. I raise the bed and it pulls the bike into the van. It doesn't nice. do it all the way. It does it kind of halfway and yeah. breaks just enough for me so to get you underneath get the bike the and then yeah. push it in. Yeah. So that was a big deal. Um, the other thing, um, they put a custom switch for the water heater for me. Since I can't reach the water heater, mm-hmm. I, I had, don't have the ability to turn it on or off because it's kind of way underneath in the cabinet. So what happened was we decided before we did the switch, we decided to just leave the water heater on, but that caused some problems because one morning I turned on my hot pot for my water and the water heater happened to be on, blew the fuses. Yeah. So to avoid that ever happening again, they put in a custom switch for me for the water heater. So I have a switch turn the water heater on and off, which is really mm-hmm. nice. And then they put in um, an extra rocker switch, like the kind of switch panel mm-hmm. by my head in the bed. And I think they're going to start doing that uh, for everybody, actually, because it's really yeah. convenient to have a switch to, you know, on the other side of the van. So you, when you're laying down in bed, bed, you can turn lights off and stuff. Yeah. That's, re- that's really nice. I think, oh, the other massive thing that everybody wants now, the thing I get the most messages about is the minimalistic pull-out drawer kitchen sink. Mm-hmm. It's epic. It's epic. Um, Nick, the head engineer, put the same thing in his van. And since I need a little more space to mm-hmm. turn around, the normal kitchen pod takes up too much space, especially having a bathroom. Yeah. There was enough space to have a kitchen pod and a bathroom. So we ixnade the kitchen pod. Oh, also because I have my lift, my wheelchair lift takes up a lot of space too. Yeah. So we decided to do a super minimalistic pull out kitchen sink. It's just like a drawer that pulls out from underneath the bed. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's really, really nice. I can't imagine having anything different than that. It's really nice. Yeah. So those are the, those are the custom things they did for me. Now it's a, it's a mid roof van. It's not mm-hmm. um, a low, low, low roof. It's not a high roof because I don't, I don't need the headspace. I'm not standing up in there. Yeah. So that's, that's nice to have that. Uh, I really mm-hmm. like the mid roof. For me, I, it's the way to go. Yeah. It's so much. I like the high roof for the headspace, but I enjoy driving the mid roof better. It just feels more like an SUV or something like that than the high roof. But I know it's that cost benefit thing that people have to debate is, do I want to be able to stand straight up in my van. Um, but for driving purposes and stuff, I definitely like the mid roof. The mid roof is nice. And it, it works great for me because I have plenty of headroom with the mid roof. Yeah. And I can reach the ceiling. I can reach everything. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be able to do that. So that's a, that's a really good thing about having the mid roof for me. Yeah. For storage and stuff. And do you use the hanging cabinets or anything like that in your van? I have hanging cabinets. Um, I'm going to be moving them around a little bit yeah, um, and, do, and doing some different stuff. I'm now getting to the point where I'm, I know the van well enough. I'm starting to experiment now with yeah. like, moving things around. That's the beautiful thing about the modular aspect of this is you can move things around. It's not set in stone. And I'm starting to familiarize myself with the 8020 website. Mm -hmm. um it's so for everybody out there the van is built with the 8020 extrusion kind of exoskeleton and you can mount anything to it and you can construct anything you want out of this extrusion so and you go to the 8020 website and i mean i'm completely overwhelmed there Mm -hmm. is endless endless possibilities all the hardware and things you can do and build um nick head engineer is going to be teaching me about how to use that website mm-hmm. and uh i'm going to build some stuff for the van with it and make a video out, out of that nice um, that's gonna that's gonna be super fun on how to use that website and how to build something yeah how to add to stuff to your, your van. current skeleton you can, stuff in your van. you can do anything to that van yeah. you can do anything with everything on that website yeah um And so it's going to do a few, that video is going to do a few things. Hopefully it's, you know, one of the main thing is alleviate um, some of the pressure on the the team. Yeah. People calling, wanting different stuff for their vans. Well, you can do all that stuff yourself pretty simply. I just 
spilled my coffee a little bit. I <laughs> talk with my hand. I talk with my hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's super exciting. Um, so those are the, the customizations that they've made for me. Um, oh, and I also, um, the mobility outfitter that installed the lift and the hand controls also installed a swivel driver seat. Okay. So both of my seats swivel because usually Van do it just as the passenger seat. Yeah, I've I've bo- both that swivel now, and that's nice. Nice. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the the Ford has the e brake in the middle there, and it typically limits the ability for that driver to to uh, swivel. But I I know there are a few places that can modify that for people. It's it swivels, but not well and not easily. You have to yeah. move the seat all the way forward, all the way up. Mm-hmm. And that takes, you know, with the electronic adjustment, seat adjustments, that takes forever. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, use, for that reason, I don't use it to transfer. Mm-hmm. I don't rotate it every time I get in and out because there's just too much work. Yeah. And I don't rotate it every time I camp either. If I'm going to, I only rotate it if I'm going to be camping multiple nights. Yeah. Um, if I'm just like pulling in somewhere for a night, I don't rotate it. Yeah. Um, but if I'm going to be somewhere for an extended period of time, then I do take the time to rotate it because it does create more space. Yeah, definitely. So when I get in and out of the van, I just transfer to the passenger seat, which rotates smoothly and easily. I just rotate to the tra- to the passenger seat to my chair and back when I get back in. Yeah. So I so I do have that. I do have the rotating driver seat as well. Then so yeah. the, that's. I think I, that's all the, most of the modifications I'm trying to think if there's anything else they've done for me. I think that's it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yes. Nice. And you mentioned your bike. Um, how did you get into mountain bike? Ooh, good question. I love this question. Um, I'm not a mountain biker. I don't consider myself a mountain biker. Okay. I am, I am now by default, but I'm, um, I'm a runner. My main, my main sports are actually running and surfing. And I always say, if I wasn't in a wheelchair, I'd be one of those like weirdo, like, um, long distance trail runners, like mm-hmm. ultra trail runners. I'd be one of those. Um, and this bike is how I get on the trail. This bike is an off-road wheelchair. It's how I, mm-hmm. it's how I hike as well. And in my mind, um, a lot of time I'm out there trail running. That's, that's what it feels like to me. That's the closest yeah. thing I, I can get to that because life in a wheelchair is relegated to the, the pavement. Hence mm-hmm. my trails project, the unpavement and, you know, it being a movement off the pavement into nature. And this bike allows me to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, God, well, how did it all start? Um, well, I was living in Mammoth, and I lived in Mammoth for 10 years, um, and it's true what they say. You move up there for the winter, and you stay for the summer, mm-hmm. because the summers in the mountains are just unbelievably epic. Yeah. Uh, there's, and in Mammoth specifically, there's so much to do. It's almost, it's almost overwhelming. It is overwhelming, not almost. It, you wake up, and you're like, ah, I have so many choices of what? adventure to go on today what am i going to do and you kind of look for like little ways of direction like friends that are doing something or someone that wants to has an idea you want to just do that you know any sort of direction to get you moving because the 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 choices of what to do are, are are so great so i was living in mammoth in the summer and everybody mountain bikes it's a bike park um and i ended up getting a bike um, so I could get out on the trail and exercise on the trail, run with my dog. I wanted to run with my dog. That's mm. was, was the main thing. And at that time, there were two types of adaptive bikes. There was one, the one I got that could climb anything, no drivetrain. It looks similar to the bike I have now with two front wheels and one rear drive wheel, mm-hmm. but much, much smaller, 20 inch front, front wheels. And that could climb, literally, like climb anything. And I quickly realized that I needed suspension because <laughs> I was taking, I was taking this fully rigid, it's fully rigid, this fully rigid bike in the bike park, and just jarring my back, getting so jarred. 
And so I, I didn't have it very long. I traded mm-hmm. that in, I sold that and got a full suspension, four wheel downhill bike, only gravity fed, no drivetrain. So it was either, either a bike that could climb anything or a bike that could downhill anything. Yeah. So I got the four wheel bike and I have never sent it more in my life than I did on that bike. The suspension is just crazy. It was like this land spider. Um, and I had so much fun on that bike, but I, I wanted to be out in the backcountry, out on the trail. And I started getting out there more on this bike, but my friends were having to push me and yeah. I had to reach back and push it like a wheelchair because there's no drivetrain whatsoever. And uh, there was a really, at that time, it was, there was the record winter. There's been two more records since then, but this was in the, the winter of, uh, I think, uh, 2009 and, and 2010. And it, it, that winter broke me. <laughs> I was broke. <laughs> I had this really shitty plastic shovel and it didn't work really well. I was doing all my own shoveling and everything. I, just, I, got, I got sick of it, man. So I moved back to San Diego. And uh, I was in San Diego with this crazy four-wheel bike that I couldn't really use because it was kind of bike park only. And I was researching ways to get on the beach and out on the trail because I want to get off-road. Mm-hmm. And I was researching off-road, off-road wheelchairs. And I came across this bike that I have now. I was like, holy crap. Drivetrain and suspension? What the heck? But you can have both now? And I had, the bike was $9,400. <laughs> and after I sold my four-wheeler, I had $9,800 in my bank account. <laughs> I bought the bike. I wrote a check. I had 400 bucks left. <laughs> <laughs> And I made the step of faith and, uh, and, you know, it took like nine months or so. And I finally got the bike Mm -hmm. and oh my God, oh my God. You know, there's for me being a wheelchair user, there's, you know, certain pieces of pieces of equipment that are life changing. Yeah. This was one of those just completely changed my life worth every single penny. And uh, I'm I'm now on my, I want to say fifth or sixth. (laughs) <laughs> one of those bikes yeah and i'm um, the us de- i'm the us dealer for them now and um man obviously going on some really cool adventures with with my bike and that's kind of how it all started <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah um, you also mentioned the uh the, the say unpavement movement could you speak mm-hmm. on that a little bit yeah so as cool as these bikes are um, and what they enable me and you know wheel, other wheelchair users out there to do have a relationship with nature is what I like to say. That bike allows yeah. me to have a relationship with nature as cool as it is. In that way, it is limited. Um, and I've gotten completely screwed out on the trail. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've even been helicoptered out. Um, and I've had just n- days that were supposed to be just normal rides um, just become pretty shitty really quick. Yeah. And I, you know, I call, I was researching, trying to find the information and there's some information out there, but not really. So I contacted trail forks and asked them trail forks is the number one mountain bike information resource for those out there that don't haven't heard of it. Um, if you mountain bike, you use the trail forks app for your trail information. And I asked them if they're interested in documenting this information because this doesn't really exist. Um, and they said, yes. So hence, <laughs> I said, henceforth started the unpavement project of mm-hmm. me documenting my, tra- me documenting my trails experiences, my trail experiences so that, um, adaptive riders, uh, can have the information to get out there safely. So I fired up a YouTube channel, started a trail blog and started sharing my experiences. And here we are, I was a three, four years later and, Mm -hmm. uh, things, (laughs) things are going really well. And, and you know, it's not just, it's not just, um, information for adaptive riders. It's bigger Mm -hmm. than that. Um, it's become bigger than that. Uh, it's it's more about 
a movement of everyone, disability or not, getting off the pavement and getting into nature because it's important. Yeah. We spend these devices, these things are so cool and they enable us to do so much and accomplish so much. And we're on them so much, mm -hmm. which is a good thing, I think, because of what these enable us to do. But because we're on them so much, it's so much more important to put it down. Yeah. And, and unplug and have a relationship with nature. Yeah. It's, it's vital. It is mandatory for mental health and well-being. Yeah. So that's what it's become. It, you know, the YouTube channel is more of just move it, motivating everybody. Just put their phone down and get out and have a relationship with nature. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and just to clarify on the point you made about the uh, unpavement, it's, so it's basically a resource. You, I know it's become more than what it started out to be, but so somebody that needs the um, adaptive riding, they know I should go to this trail and I shouldn't go to this trail. Is that kind of what it is? Yes. Now we're still in the infancy stages where i mean there's a lot of trails out there and yeah. i'm one guy yeah um so we're in this for the long game and i say yeah. we i mean me <laughs> it's yeah. pretty much a one band one man band at this point um and where it's, it's about big data so right now i am I'm, I'm working on um formalizing the trail documentation protocol mm -hmm. and once i'm done with that i'll be training ambassadors so other adaptive riders to do the same in their respective areas. Mm -hmm. And you think every ride, every trail, if they're going online afterwards and doing their trail work, you know, it's online trail, you know, I'm in a wheelchair. I can't really contribute. I can't really grab a shovel and go yeah. provide physical trail work, but I can do my trail work online afterwards. Yeah. So if I get these, me and these ambassadors across the globe, I've, I'm talking to ambassadors um, in Australia, New Zealand, Russia, South America, um, Central America. And uh, I think over time, every trail, every ride that maybe in a decade or two, you know, that um, a lot of trails out there will be documented and yeah. this information will be provided. And uh, adaptive riders can use the app like anybody else. That is the yeah. goal. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Super fun, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's such a cool movement. It, it'll be cool to see what it grows into. Just because I'm sure there's a community of people out there that need to other adaptive riders that show up and have the horrible experiences that you had in the past and would if they would have had a resource they would have known to go to the right spot so i'm excited to see what it grows into you and me both <laughs> i'm excited for it too and honestly that's how the van comes into play mm -hmm. um, i need to be able to spend time out there uh you know can the subaru i can camp out of the subaru and i'm comfortable enough like it gets the job done, but I get uncomfortable really quick. Um, so it ends up being just like a few days in one spot where I need to spend a month, you know, or for at least, mm -hmm. a, at least a couple of weeks or a week, you know, at least. So that's what the van, the van enables me to do to kind of extend my time out there documenting trails. Yeah. And it's, it's a big deal, man. Cause if I can, and a lot of trails take multiple passes too, you know, I just yeah. ride it one time, one day. Okay. I've got an idea, but I really need to ride it the other direction mm -hmm. and stop and take some photos and collect waypoints and, and spend a little more detailed time with that trail. Yeah. And that takes being out there longer and being out there longer um, means being comfortable. And especially as a paraplegic where being comfortable takes a little bit extra stuff and mm -hmm. the van provides that for me yeah is there are there certain characteristics that make a trail more adaptable or not adaptable for people oh that's a tough question because it's so organic mm -hmm. um 
you know, trails are so different in every situation, every rock is so mm -hmm. different, you know, and not only that, but every rider and every bike is different. The gamut of adaptive riders is so huge. Um, mm -hmm. I, when I'm assessing a trail, I, I, uh, I base it on a formula of, um, rider ability Okay. You know, whether they're beginner, intermediate, expert, rider disability, their spinal cord injury, how high their spinal cord injury is, mm -hmm. what their upper body strength is like, what their stamina is like, but also equipment capability. Um, there's all different types of adaptive bikes. They're so different. There's mm -hmm. um, front, my bike's rear wheel drive, but there's also front wheel drive bikes. So what they can climb is very different. Um, bikes with and without power assist, bikes with and without suspension, mm -hmm. um, clearance, you know, there's so many different widths, of course, big one. There's so many different factors. Yeah. So to answer the question, you know, there's not really one type of adaptive trail. Um, and it's really hard to set standards for that reason. Is that Kenzie? Yeah. <laughs> Is that her? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> What's up, woman? <laughs> She's in her own little world. Now. Yeah, I got my headphones in right now, so she can't hear you. But oh, so I'm like just screaming in your ear. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. It's okay. Um. Okay. Where were we? What were we talking about? We were talking about the rating system on the okay trails. I think we were maybe wrapping oh, yeah. up. Yeah um get gamut of riders and there's just not the misconception out there is that there's one type of adaptive trail this is an adaptive trail well one i don't want adaptive trails because to me that sounds like segregation yeah that sounds like a trail that's going to be very intermediate and boring and that nobody else is going to want to ride and that i'm relegated to that doesn't sound like a good time to me i want to ride trails that everybody else is riding and um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like what I can ride with somebody or without is very different. So there can be a trail that's, you know, that I might not necessarily be able to ride by myself, but it's still an awesome experience with a support rider, you know? Yeah. So there's that type, there's that level of, a, of adaptive trail. Yeah. Um, and, you know, usually for a lot of trails, it just, for me to ride it solo, it's just a, you know, a spot or two, a couple, couple little spots that need an adjustment. And if that's the case, it's a no brainer, you know, make it so I can get through solo, get a whole other user group through a trail. Yeah. Now I never want to, never want to dumb anything down, um, or never want to change the nature of a trail ever. Um, in that case, just, I'm just not going to ride that yeah. trail, you know? So, and there's, and there's, you know, there's different levels of riders and there's different types of trails, you know, maybe I can't ride a trail solo the first few times, but after practice and repetition, I get it, I get the line and I'm able to ride it solo. There's several trails like that, that I yeah. couldn't ride by myself before, but now I'm able to, you know, after figuring it out yeah. and there's that type of trail too. So it's a very organic process. The answer to that question is, is really difficult. Um, so my recommendation to land management is to have a professional consultant come out because there's really so many factors involved and that's, it's much, much better that way. Yeah. It's, it's way more complicated than like m most people where it's just like easy, intermediate, difficult, just because right. some, some trails you're going to need somebody to go through with you to help you get over. Is it like a log or something that you may have to get over things like that or like a hill that you can't quite get? Well, um, that's funny that you mentioned that because there's a trail here across the street that there's, there's a log across the trail, like a, a felled tree that has become part that has become a feature on the trail. And my mm -hmm. friend was like, Oh, you're going to need help on that. That log is nothing to me. Yeah. It's absolutely. A little blip. I can, I have my bike, is, I have a skid plate, I have clearance, I have suspension. I just pop right up and over that. No mm -hmm. problem. So you find, you hear that a lot, like, oh, you know, people think that, you know, one thing is going to stop this bike and it doesn't. 
you'd be really surprised what this bike can get through. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you're going to be really surprised what stops it. I mean, there'll be some crazy rock garden where that most people walk because the suspension and capability of this machine, it's it's literally nothing. Like I was down it, up it, no problem. You know, not even a, not even really a thought, not even a challenge even a lot of the time. And people are very surprised by that. But then what stops it will be the smallest, stupidest thing where it's like, really? You can't go through that? I'm like, oh, man, I got to get a spot. I got to get help through this. Like just minor off camber. That is the nemesis of this bike is off camber and especially exposed off camber. Like if there's a, you know, pretty narrow trail with some maybe an uphill rock Mm -hmm. where and a soft shoulder where I get up on that rock and now the bike can tip over. Yeah. Um, and with a soft shoulder, my downhill wheel can get sucked into the fall line really, really quickly and easily. Yeah. Um, so that is the nemesis is off camber mostly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, pinch points, tree gates, um, things like that can pose a, a pretty good issue. Yeah. Yep. But dude, you should be surprised how I can get through tree gates, man. With this, um, if there's not a ride, if I can't figure out a ride around, um, mm-hmm. like prob- problem solve through it. I've gotten through super tight tree gates by myself with nobody around me. You know, mm-hmm. I kind of problem solve, get one wheel up, and I'll like put put my coffee mug down here. Um, I'll put like one hand. I have a, a throttle as well, and so I'll hold myself up on one tree, and then just like just like punch the throttle a little bit mm-hmm. and then I'll get my front wheel through that'll that'll slam down on the other side of the tree and then kind of angle through you know problem solving is a big part of adaptive mountain biking yeah lots of problem solving involved yep yeah so does your bike have a little bit of an electric assist on it when you mentioned the throttle it has more than a little bit it has it, it ha- does have an official full electric assist yeah oh nice um and so my first bike, I was fully anti anything powered. Um, I'm, you know, my ego, my young ego was telling mm-hmm. me, Oh, I am, I am young, strong, paraplegic, not a quadriplegic. I don't need anything powered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I got a fully analog bike. That first one I bought for 9,400 bucks. Um, and I took that bike on awesome adventures, Moab, um, mammoth Sedona all around and it was awesome but my rides were like five to ten miles. if I did a 10 mile ride that was super rare and if I were to do a 10 mile ride I couldn't do anything for days afterwards mm-hmm. um, you have to you might as well be walking next to me on any climb or anything and anything technical you're gonna have to help me push me through because I didn't I don't have the power or momentum to get up over rocks and yeah. stuff and um all my ligaments and joints are all blown out now torn rot- rotator cuff um all from riding that analog bike you know riding a hand cycle on the road is one thing mm-hmm. but out on the trail is a completely different animal when you're adding rocks and and terrain and oh yeah yeah it's totally different and wet, much much more difficult much more stress on the on the on the body yeah um and now with a power assist bike, my rides are 15 to 20 miles. I'm hanging with the pack. I'm not a strain on the pace at all. Yeah. Um, I set my power assist level. Um, it's adjustable to the pace of whoever I'm with. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, I'm not going above and beyond um, like e-bike speed. I'm going regular mountain bike speed. I have it turn the assist on just enough to keep up basically. Yeah you know and it's not perfect all the time you know but you know whatever we figure out the pace yeah um i say that because a lot of adaptive mountain bikers just bump up the power and moto around and Mm -hmm. to ride with them you got they're going e-bike speed you got to be on a you have to be on an e-bike too to hang with them Mm -hmm. um on an analog bike you you, you're you're gonna there's no way they're going too fast so i'd say that because a lot of adaptive riders that i ride with do that and that's fine that's just not my style. I want to go regular mountain bike speed. The purpose of my power assist is I call it my equalizer. So I'm going normal mountain bike speed. 
And, uh, yeah, so my rides are 15 to 20 miles now. And I'm just, my joints aren't strained to the point of blowing out. Yeah. <laughs> well, they are, but that doesn't have anything to do with the bike. That's just age. Yeah. <laughs> and for, um, steering, um, I have options. Um, so my hands are on the handlebar going downhill. That's how I steer. My hands are off the handlebar and on the hand crank. It's a pedal assist. So when the crank is going, the motor is assisting. Um, the question of engineering is how then do I steer with my hands mm -hmm. off the handlebar? Um, there's a chest pad in front of me with cables that go through the frame and are attached to the bottom of the stem. So I steer with my chest when I'm cranking, but that's not precision steering. That's, uh, you know, I need to be on wide open stuff, fire roads, double track, stuff like that. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a boat where I'll like start to steer and it takes, it takes a while for it to go. And then yeah. I start to go, I'm like, Oh wait, I gotta go back the other way. And I end up overcorrecting and doing this thing. Yeah. You do when you're driving a boat. Um, so when I'm on trail, not on wide stuff, um, I need to have one hand on the handlebar to steer the trail. And because I have a power assist, I can crank with one arm. Nice. Um, I'm not getting my heart rate as high as when I'm cranking with two hands. So I prefer to crank to climb up the heinous st wide stuff. Mm -hmm. um, my friends hate me, hate me for that. Cause I make them, I, I prefer to climb fire roads because yeah. um, I can crank with two hands and get a much better workout. Um, and then the other option I have is I have a, I have a throttle, which I mentioned earlier and that I'll use for problem solving situations to get through technical stuff where I have to have both hands up on the handlebar. I need precision steering, but mm -hmm. I still need to uh, propel myself. Got a notification for a call coming up. Oh, that's for us. Oh, that's weird. Hmm. Unless I have another, unless I have another call. I didn't think I did. <laughs> um, let me just check and make sure I don't have something else. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think I did. No, no, that was, that, that was for us. That was weird. Cool. I just had it. Um, just a notification for our call. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I've got um, downhill, hands on the handlebar, um, crank with two hands, crank with one hand, steer with the other, and then thumb throttle. Those are my nice. options. Yeah. Are you able to charge your bike in the van? Yeah, I am actually. Um, and it works really, really well. There's an outlet right next to it. Mm -hmm. I have the charger in there ready to go. And so when I, I roll the bike in, get everything closed up, I get inside and I just plug it right in and the van charges it up. It's, That's awesome. It's nice. And I have um, a, a, a slower 2.5 amp charger. So it's just, it charges a little more slowly, which is, mm -hmm. which is better for the battery. Um, yeah. And better on the draw on the van. Like if there's sunlight, like it hardly pulls anything mm -hmm. um, off of there. Like it, basically the sun is charging my bike. It's, it's yeah. pretty amazing. It works really well. And then of course, if I'm driving, the bike's plugged in, the van just, it just charges it up and the bike yeah. is charged up by the time I get to my next destination. It works. It works really good, dude. It works really good. Yeah, I couldn't remember. Do you have the AGM setup in yours or the lithium setup? I sprung for the lithium. Yeah. Um, you know, it's expensive, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. It's so nice. And um, I wanted my van to stay relevant as long as possible. We were discussing this and around the fire in Moab. Mm. You know. In a few years, everything's going to be lithium, and yeah. I, I just and so that's why I that's yeah. pretty much the main reason. It's more of an economical decision, but yeah. I'm really glad I made it because I rarely need to plug in. Rarely, mm -hmm. um, I, I can go. Uh, what well, I was in Moab for what two and a half days, three days, um, didn't plug in at all, and had plenty, plenty of electricity. Yeah, that's awesome. Never had to turn on the engine, charge it up. Never. Mm -hmm. do you have a it's really nice I know, highly recommended to upgrade to lithium yeah i, I know there's a, a handful of people that have gotten the agm and then brought their van back to get the lithium system just because they felt like it was worth it it's it is way worth it and if you're financing it i mean yeah an extra okay it's 6800 bucks to upgrade to lithium and if you're financing that it just that small and especially if you're doing long-term financing yeah. That little bit more a month is totally worth what you're going to get with the lithium. It's, do it. 
anybody out there listening, getting a van, get lithium. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. It's so sure. much better. Uh, of the like typical band do it components, are there ones that you would say are a must like the lithium? Uh, the TV. <laughs> the TV, yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel. I know a lot of people, they don't like that answer. But I love it. I love sports. I love so it. I have to plug it. I have to, to watch like, I'm a Chiefs fan, so we're rivals in that aspect. But um, if the closet, Chiefs are on, I'm a closet Chiefs fan. <laughs> really? Oh, how can or? you not be a Mahomes fan? How can yeah. you not be? The guy's so off. And uh, your running back Williams went to my yeah. high school. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm a yeah. I'm a Justin so, Herbert I'm a fan. I'm not a Chargers fan, but I do like Justin Herbert. Dude, he's he's fun to watch, definitely. Yeah. And it's hard not to be an Eckler fan either. Eckler, yeah. freaking awesome, undrafted free agent, mm -hmm. and is just killing it. Uh, yeah, I gotta watch my sports, but I got the TV. I originally wanted a uh, a monitor so I can edit video in the van. That was my goal: mm -hmm. edit video in the van on the road. Um, and that's completely when you get a van, like you have one idea and it's always something totally different. I, mm -hmm. I haven't done, I don't do edit any editing on the road. I haven't at all. Like I'm mostly mm -hmm. like I'm on the road, I'm collecting footage. I'm filming. I don't yeah. even have, I don't have time to edit and I'm barely on the computer. I don't even, I, I don't even, I very rarely even pulled my computer out um, yeah. on the road. But what I do like to do when I'm getting ready for bed or like say, say I pull in somewhere and you know, I'm, I crack a beer after being on the road all day and I'm making a little dinner or, you know, I'm, I'm going to the bathroom or I'm just like laying in bed, passing out. I like to have something on. I like yeah. to have the, the, the TV on. I like to have something on either, you know, a documentary or new girl or, <laughs> you know, something about aliens. I don't know. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. And the TV has really been an awesome thing to have. To, I hate to say it. Never thought I would say that ever, but it's been really nice. And also for tailgating. Yeah. I got, um, uh, you probably saw it in Moab. I got a hitch mount barbecue that swings around to the side. It's a mm -hmm. company called Hitchfire. Awesome product. Um, all you listeners out there, check out Hitchfire. Hitch mount barbecue swings around to the side. So with the barbecue swung out and the awning out, it's like this tailgate, yeah. awesome tailgate spot. And mm -hmm. the TV rotates enough where you can, when you're outside the van, you can see it really well because it kind of rotates maybe a fifth of a turn or so, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just enough where you can have a game on on the TV and be outside drinking beer tailgating and be able to like watch the game outside the van, which yeah. I really, I really like that aspect of it. Um, but as far as, okay, that's like um, above and beyond like living comfort, you know? Yeah. So as far as like living comfort, what I would, what I would get, what's a must, um, the hot water heater. Um, it's, it's really nice um, having hot water, man. Uh, yeah. On a cold night. Oh, even bigger than that. I can't believe I didn't think about this first. The S bar heater. Oh mm -hmm. my God. Oh my God, dude. Um, even just here, like we've had a couple of freezes here. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I turned the heater on to the, the lowest setting. Uh, the lowest it goes is 48 so that the pipes, the water don't, doesn't freeze in the van. Mm -hmm. Dude. And it's, it's so efficient. It uses almost no gas. It sips off yeah. the gas line, uses almost no gas. And yeah. oh my God, being, being San Diego, California soft, yeah. <laughs> having the, having that S bar heater has been a huge, huge difference. I would say that is the number one thing. Lithium yeah. and S bar heater are the, are the two number ones, man. You got to, you got to, um, yeah. and the water heater too is, is really nice. It's like instant hot water. It works mm -hmm. so well. Um, like I've had the van at the beach and I'm washing everybody's feet off at the beach. There's strangers yeah. walking by. I'm like, Hey, come here, come feel this. And I, they, they <laughs> take the feet, and I like hose off their feet with like a super hot, like nice hot water. And um, they're yeah. always stoked. They're always, yeah. And all my friends, after we surf, all come over to my van and we all rinse off with the hot water. 
mm-hmm. afterwards. Um, it's the hot water heater is really nice too. But I'd yeah. say, I'd say number one is the S bar. That's yeah. that's number one. That's probably yeah. the most consistent answer I've heard is the S bar. Just it's not fun being cold, and once you're cold, it's hard to get warm again. No, no, so. No. Yeah. And, you know, usually on the road, I'm riding, I got a lot to do. I got a tight schedule and filming and I need to get sleep and being cold sleeping. I have a really nice, you know, zero degree sleeping bag. It can keep me warm, but I got to be all bundled up in it. Or yeah. A part sticks out. Then I get cold or, yeah. <laughs> runs it, you know, I, I hate being cold camping. I, I, I've just been shivering all night long too many times. Mm-hmm. And I just don't want to do that anymore yeah yeah For sure. and with the s-bar i can turn it up to 73 and yeah just be sprawled out naked in the bed <laughs> <laughs> and no problem yeah <laughs> just like home just like home <laughs> uh, you guys are getting a van you said right or you're trying to you want um, to? no so early on we had a van from van do it as like uh, rep vehicle when we were just like trying to get Vandua out there as much as possible. We had one of the inventory units. Um, and then once kind of once COVID hit it, we we're kind of one of the few industries that kind of took off during COVID just because everybody was like, I need something where I can still travel and get out there and go see nature where everything else was kind of getting shut down. But the, then our inventory units just like sold like hotcakes kind of. So we yep. would put one on the yep. website and yep. then be gone the next day. So, and that's still kind yep. of happening right now. So that's kind of what happened. Dude, with I, could that van. Sell, I could sell my van for more yeah. than what I bought it for right now. It's really freaking crazy. I don't want to, and I'm not going to Yeah, because of the lifestyle that thing affords me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's crazy. The van thing right now, it's, it's nuts. Yeah, we've had some of the inventory units that we literally post and then 15 minutes later, I get a notification from one of the sales gurus that's like, it's gone. So we need to take it off the yep. site. So rad. Yeah. So good for you guys, man. You guys are yeah. killing it. Um, so uh, for your blog that you're writing, um, do you think what well, you have uh, enough information Definitely. for that? Definitely. Okay, cool. Yeah, we you weren't taking note. You weren't taking notes at all. Does that mean you're gonna listen to this whole thing again? Yeah, I'll probably go back and and re-listen to it. And I'm more of a audio guy than m- most of my notes I take end up being gibberish anyway. So I I like to go back and listen <laughs> and and kind of like pause the video and and re-listen to stuff. So all right, cool. Well, let me know if you have any 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 other questions or whatever. And then yeah. uh, I can send you photos and videos and stuff, of course. Yeah, that would be awesome. And we can, uh, once you post this to your, your YouTube or wherever you post your, your podcast and stuff, we can in, embed that into the blog as well. So kind of double Oh, cool. Tips. All right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, this I will, I'm not going to edit it at all. I just post raw. Boom. Okay. Um, just the, the full conversation on my, my podcast and my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing, I've been trying to do Mondays, I have a new, I do a podcast on Monday and a, and a video on Friday. And I try to do mm-hmm. shorts all throughout the week, YouTube shorts through the week. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to don't always stick to that. Um, but yeah, my plan, this would go out a week from Monday. Cool. Yeah. So we'll yeah. even put in there to all your, stuff so people subscribe to your youtube channel and and all that so rad um well thanks for hanging out with me my brother yeah thank you i appreciate talking a little over an hour now so i appreciate your time heck yeah man it was fun and uh i'm gonna go get on the trail right now <laughs> oh nice. rad. yep yeah hopefully we can that's the, that's the reason to live here is yeah. i can just ride out of my house trails across the street yeah, Kohler Mountain becoming Bike Reserve like, is across the street. Feels like it's becoming like the national mountain biking area, like the hub for mountain biking in the United States. That's what they want it to be. And it's, it is a good place to do that because of the industry and because of what they've done with trails here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and now their adaptive mountain bike infrastructure is 
is awesome. What I can ride here um, solo mm-hmm. and not just, and what like advanced trails I can ride here solo is, is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's like trails. There's like bike park level trails here mm-hmm. for free. It's insane across the street. That's awesome. <laughs> I've it's never insane. been. It's I insane. need to go. Well, I have a guest room. All right. So. We'll come visit sometime. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Bring the, don't bring the angry cat. We won't. <laughs> he doesn't like to travel. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, we'll talk soon. All right, man. Have a great rest Thanks of your so day. Thanks so much, Lane. You All too. Right. See you, man. Adios. Thank you.